Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna almost close out the year 1368 today. That's right, nearly there. We are almost done with this year, as shocking as that might seem. Of course, most of these books take place over a, a larger time frame than that. Like, for instance, Spine of the World, uh, you know, is technically 1369 because that's where it ends, but it, of course, takes a, a longer time than that, and Lies of Light goes for, I think, five years or whatever it was since uh, the end of Whisper of Waves. But on our little cheat sheet here that we're using, 1369, 68 has just a ton of books, and we're going to talk about a few more of them today. The Prince of Lies, which is kind of, sort of, technically, but not really, book four of the Avatar trilogy, essentially because it follows some of those same plot lines. First of all, I have to say, this book has possibly the best prologue ever written for anything ever. If you don't believe me, go to a library, go to a used bookstore, I don't know, maybe it's available for Kindle or whatever, find a copy of this somewhere, Pick it up, just read the prologue. If you aren't hooked from that prologue, then you probably want to follow exactly the opposite of any of my advice when it comes to reading books because we have very different tastes. So this is by James Lauder, I believe, which is exciting for me. I always seem to have a soft spot for the editors at the time, and I believe he was the editor at the time that this was written. So this book is essentially about two big things. The first thing is Kellen Four Lions Bane coming into his own as the god of death now and coming to terms with being the god of death, and not trying to be a good guy, having to figure out that he needs to be balanced. The other thing is Cyric growing madder and madder and more and more insane, but coming up with this brilliant plan that I absolutely love because it is seriously one of the best, most original sort of evil plans I've ever seen in a book anywhere. And that is that he's going to get this book created that will be ensorcelled to the point that, so the book is going to be the true history of Cyric. And it's going to tell basically how he was the hero of the Avatar trilogy and how he's awesome and how you should follow Cyric. It's going to be ensorcelled so that you will believe it and become a Cyrocyte after reading it. How awesome is that? I mean, how much more excited would missionaries be if they had a Bible that was ensorcelled to the point that anyone reading it would be like, wow, Jesus is the way and the light. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it would, it would cut down on so much time and effort, right? The book has more to it than just these two things, but they are kind of the lodestones about, around which every other plot thread revolves. The prologue gets played out even worse, even going so far as this one point, it really felt almost Warhammer 40k-ish to me, because we had giant metal machines of death inside which were men, kind of trapped against their will. It felt very 40k-ish to me. I was a little frustrated that in the end that plot line gets resolved in a kind of sort of, and they all lived happily ever after sort of way, but when you read the hell that these characters had to go through to get to that point, it is lessened, it, it feels less sitcom-y because of that. Not a hell of a lot to say about this book, except that it's really cool, and in a lot of ways I don't want to comment on it because it just builds to what I think is pure awesomeness in The Trial of Cyric the Mad, the final book in the Avatar trilogy, which is Crucible Trial of Cyric the Mad, which is just awesome. Just insanely, insanely good. But this one works as a good bridge. I, When I read it, which was like five years ago, I read the entire book rather than skimming, which I did with a lot of the Avatar trilogy stuff. Uh, this is really good stuff. Lies of Light, book two of the Watercourse trilogy. As all of you who've been listening know, I was a huge, huge fan of Whisper of Waves, and then I read uh, the Baldur's Gate novelization, and was like, what the hell happened to Phil Athens? I don't know which one he wrote first. I don't know where this falls in it, but... Um, it, it really made me wonder, am I going to like this at all? What the hell's going on here? I gotta say, Lies of Light is good. It continues everything that Whisper of Waves did. It felt a little less exciting, I guess, because uh, the people and the characters weren't new, and they just kind of continued what they were doing. Very few things happen in this book until the very end, but it's not... It, it, it doesn't feel slow, and it doesn't feel bad. It, it read really quickly for me. It just feels like the middle part of a trilogy, if you will. The main thing to happen, besides the kind of very end, there's a big thing that happens at the end. That It, it was one of those moments, like in MST3K, where they're like, you know, come on, we know she's a werewolf. It's that sort of feeling, like, the final chapter is like seven pages long or so, and it could have been two paragraphs, because it was telegraphed so much where it was going. Overall, however... 
The big thing that I got out of this is, boy, Firea is screwed up. She's really screwed up. Let me, um, let me give you a little hint of her madness, okay? This is her talking to her now mother-in-law because she gets married to, uh, Corvin, the guy who's up and coming. There are all these sort of, like, emotional battles going on here because this is an, ob an objectivist book, so people can't really, like, talk about their feelings. They just have to do random things and see how they respond, even though they know it'll cause them pain. I don't know. It's so weird, but it's very... It feels more human than people who follow what we want them to do, I guess. It's it's strange. It's so difficult to describe objectivist books because I find objectivism goofy, and I find kind of the point of objectivist books really patronizing and stupid, but I absolutely find the characters fascinating and love reading about them. So, oh, yeah, so I'm setting this up, and I got totally sidetracked there. So this is her talking to her mother-in-law, and, you know, her mother-in-law is trying to be like, oh, hey, dear, do you like your new life, and blah, 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 blah. And Firea shows her all the cuts that she has on her leg where she's cut herself and she says for at least the space of a heartbeat all you think about is the little stab of pain and not the horrible bloated beast of a woman that's sitting across from you the pretty but frivolous man you've sold yourself to like a whore's whore and the sad pathetic ruin of your own life <laughs> it gets worse from there that's what's great that's the reason why Firea is so fun she's just all over the map in this one and, you know, hats off to crazy chicks. I mean, that's really all I gotta say. Also, if you're curious about the title, title gets tied in really well here. I'd rather hear the waves whisper of nothing than suffer through the lies of light. A nice little thought. Not really sure what it means. I have a theory, but I don't know if it's exactly what Athens wanted. And I think possibly part of the intention of it being so kind of ambiguous is for you to figure it out for yourself, if you will. But that's the cipher through which those titles make sense. I don't even know what the last one is. Scream of Stone, I think? So that'll be interesting. I don't know why the stone would be screaming. Yeah, I'm really curious to see how this trilogy ends itself because this book, just a lot of stuff kind of happened, but nothing really big happened, if that makes sense. So I'm really curious to see where it goes. Very curious about Pristalef. He seems such a loose cannon in terms of morality and what he's fighting for, etc., etc., etc. And just seeing a Genazi is fun. Promise of the Witch King, it's frustrating because I really like Servant of the Shard, and if I understand it correctly, I think Promise of the Witch King was written years and years later, where Salvatore seems to have gotten better and better as the years go by, yet I just did not care for Promise of the Witch King at all. It starts out alright, and then it becomes essentially this gigantic ensemble piece, and it becomes in a lot of ways a very, I don't want to say generic, but expected dungeon crawl with all of these characters, two of whom are Jal Axel and Entreri. I ended up skimming most of it, but I would come back and read during certain bits because I do really like these characters and I find their interaction really intriguing. And like, for instance, reading the uh, the last ten pages or so, that was better than reading the whole book to me. It kind of felt like, yeah, they fought some guys and then this bit happened and it's cool. And if you really like Salvatore's fight scenes, then this is definitely the book for you. Because essentially, as I said, it is largely a dungeon crawl, and it's them fighting lots and lots and lots of different monsters. And, uh, lots of party. <laughs> it's not quite a TPK, of course, at the end, because, well, Jarl Axel and Entreri can't die, right? But they fight a Draco Lich, it's huge, lots of characters get killed. And I'm very curious to see where Road of the Patriarch goes. I've heard lots of different things about this, and I'm like, there's no way he's really going to talk about that sort of stuff, is there? And it, it's, I'm, I'm definitely intrigued by it. And I find it very bizarre that this was apparently written years after a lot of the intervening stuff was written, so I'll be really curious to see if, like, Entreri and Jarlax will just drop out of the main Drizzt stuff. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, this one was totally skippable to me, except for the last ten pages or so. I really want to see what Jarlaxle's grand plan is. Maybe that's how they fit back into the Drizzt books, like, two or three Drizzt books down the line, we have Drizzt party going to Vasa, and Jarlaxle and Entreri are just ruling it at that point, and they're like, yeah, it's a long story. Anyway, I'm totally okay with that. We'll go back to Rotor the Patriarch and finish up 1368 next time. Let's go ahead and skip ahead to the next Drizzt book, The Spine of the World, which I accidentally started way, way, way long ago when I didn't have my list with me, and I only had some books, and Spine of the World was in there by accident, so I went ahead and started on it. Did not realize that it was so far in advance of where I was at the time, so I read it just a couple of chapters at a time over a long period of time. 
I really, really liked Spine of the World. Like, surprisingly so. I was really kind of dreading this book because I knew it was a lot about Wolfgar. I really didn't like the Wolfgar bits in, uh, not Servant of the Shard, whatever the last one was before this. Not Passage to Dawn, it was the one in between there, whatever. I didn't like his stuff after he left the party. I loved how he left the party and I, I loved the idea of him just living in torment with these thoughts and not being able to relate to everybody. It felt like how, you know, Buffy season three should have gone with Angel, but they couldn't because Boreanaz is contractually obligated to appear in so many scenes. And it, it really worked for me. But then after he leaves the party, it's like him getting with the sky ponies and him doing this and him drinking. And it's like, yeah, I get it. And so I thought an entire book of this, like where, where do you go with this? What do you do? And I would say about the first half of the book is pretty much, it has that problem. It's essentially, well, he's drinking and pushing people away, woo. And it's not very interesting, but Salvatore, I think really understood that this could be a problem, struggled with it and came up with this brilliant idea of making the book two separate plot lines so that the other plot line feels as if it's never gonna connect with our main plot line, and I actually kind of hoped that it didn't, simply because I, uh, uh, it, it's such a cool plot line that I was like, I don't really want it to interfere with our kind of meh plot line with Wolfgar, but when it does, it's cool. Getting a little ahead of myself, point being, we follow this other plot line about a, uh, a young village girl. It's very, like, Tess of the De Herbervilles, very, a young village girl, and the, like, Baron or whatever of the local dookie or what have you sees her on the street, falls in love with her instantly, and it becomes this grand pair parody of chivalric romance and what those books try to tell us and, you know, uh, that sort of old school idea of uh, fantasy and um, medieval times, etc, etc, etc. So she's being wooed by him. She doesn't love him, but he can help out her mother who's sick and ailing because, you know, it's medieval times and so everybody dies easily. And she's got a crush on this, like, emo boy who works the farms, which this is just some of the best writing that Salvatore has ever done. So listen to this. This is Jocka Sculli, or Jocka Scully, however you want to pronounce it, the emo boy that she has the crush on. What justice is this life, he cried. Oh, fie to have been born a pauper, I, when the mantle of a king would be better suited. What justice allows that fool Ferengal to claim the prize? What universal order so decrees that the purse is stronger than the loins? Oh, fie this life, and damn Meralda. Ferengal, of course, being the lord who has a crush on Meralda, the girl he's in love with. But so, of course, essentially, all that's going on here is he wants to bang her first. But he's a he's a drama queen, except a dude. And it's just it's it's so like you can you can so picture some young actor with like an emo over uh, an emo comb over, you know, just spouting these lines in like coveralls with like a pitchfork. That's how I always pictured him. Everybody around him gets that he's a little goofy. Jocka came back with a great dramatic sigh. Yes, all joy has flown from this coil. Boys daft, the farmer holding Jocka said to his companion. <laughs> the Wolfgar plotline becomes far more interesting about halfway through where he and uh, Morik, the rogue, have to leave Luskin and fend for themselves. But Wolfgar doesn't really want to do anything anymore and Morik only knows illegal things, so essentially Wolfgar is like, okay, we'll become bandits. And it's really uncomfortable because Wolfgar, who is supposed to be the kind of shining star of the Icewind Dale stuff, who is our chaotic good barbarian who, you know, is supposed to kind of hold up everything that means something in this world, blah, 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 is suddenly beating people up for their money. I, Wolfgar has never really been my favorite character at all, but I'll admit, even for me, it was disconcerting to see this. And there are really horrible bits that we see from his imprisonment by Urtu and his tortures. I, you know, you hear, like, tortured by a demon for years, and it's like, obviously you know that's bad, but some of the things that Salvatore thinks up are really, really distressing. I don't want to talk about them simply because they're used for tying up everything in the end, and they make it, like, you know, kind of have an emotional impact, and it's like, if I talk about it, I'm afraid it will give it away way too easily if you haven't read this and you are curious because of my review. I don't mind spoilers so much, but this is one of those things where I'd like to kind of keep it under wraps just in case you don't know. And essentially, because of how the two plot lines intersect and what happens there, Wolfgar kind of finally comes to his senses and decides, you know, I have to sober up, I have to face my demons, I have to start living in the now rather than just beating myself up over the past. 
I feel like in fiction, when people have this kind of like moment and they come out of things, you want to feel like they've earned it. Like they've had to toil a little bit to get to that point. If you make it too easy, it lessens the impact of real life people who have to deal with post-traumatic stress disorder, who are broken by life, and who give in. It, it makes it it makes them seem weak, I guess, and I think that's a horrible, horrible thing to do. With Wolfgar, I felt like he had earned it. I felt like it took long enough time, you know, like over two books that he's essentially like dealing with this, and I felt like it made sense. Like he was, and, and his ending isn't exactly a happy ending, it's a hopeful ending. So I'm okay with that. I'm totally okay with that. I thought it was well done. Here he is kind of pondering everything that's happened to him and uh, the title of the book, apparently. He spent the next hour not in his cell, but back in the spine of the world, that great dividing line between who he once was and what he had become. That physical barrier that seemed such an appropriate symbol of the mental barrier within him. The wall he had thrown up like an emotional mountain range to hold back the painful memories of Ertu. In his mind's eye, he was there now, sitting on the spine of the world, staring out over Icewind Dale on the life he once knew, then turning around to face south in the miserable existence he now suffered. It's a little on the nose, <laughs> but it's really good writing, I think. And I was really happy to see where this book went. Not happy because <laughs> I loved watching all the characters in pain, because that's kind of what it is for about 75% of it, but happy because it didn't feel cheap, it didn't feel like an easy way out, it felt earned. All right, that's enough for now. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.